been six weeks since Easter Sunday, nine weeks since we last worshiped face to face in the sanctuary. We've been isolated from groups of people in a precautionary quarantine, even from our family members. Yes, parents are at home with their children since the schools have been closed, but they must keep their distance from the grandparents and from their friends. There is some sadness, there is some loneliness, there is some fear. Of course, many people have died all over the world. It's hard to believe that it's been six weeks since Easter Sunday, nine weeks since the closure of restaurants, bars, and most local businesses. We've stayed at home, we've stayed separate, we've stayed connected through the internet and through phone calls, but it's not been an easy spring. But spring it is. You just look at the daffodils and the lilacs, look at the tulips and the hyacinths, the forsythia are blooming, the, the budding trees, the grass has grown long enough to mow and the squirrels and the birds are chattering and chirping. They're singing and nesting. They're climbing and running and flying. It's almost like we can see resurrection happening everywhere around us as things start to come back alive. And they are starting up again in our business life, in our social life, and in the world of nature. You can't stop life. I mean, one reason we can trust Jesus' resurrection is because we see it in so many other ways all around us. See, resurrection is another word for change, for rapid, radical change, particularly positive change, where you thought there was no future, there is. So what seems to be dead comes back to life. Darkness turns to light. Loneliness and isolation turn to renewed friendship and social mixing. As the world itself seems to recover from winter lockdown, our spirits also are revived. We say hallelujah, we are alive, we have survived. Jesus is alive, God is in control all the time. When the news is bad, when the outlook is bleak, as it has been for so many months now, People tend to see things only in the very short run. The statistics of contagion and death, they lead the news every day, 24-7, 365, right? And where other natural disasters too, like the recent tornadoes in the south, or last year's flooding, the wildfires in Australia and in California, that kind of news shocks us. It shocks us in the short run. We didn't anticipate it, we're overwhelmed. But in the long run, that which looks like death is usually part of a much longer term corrective or a change for the positive. I mean, I am much more optimistic than old Reverend Malthus. Malthus who theorized that epidemic disease, famine, starvation, and occasional war serve periodically to reduce the population so that the basic economy and the food supply will be sustainable. That's Malthusian theory. In an essay on the principle of population, which was first published in 1798, Malthus wrote about what he considered an imminent crisis in light of nature's laws. People always have sex, they always need food, and the rate of human population growth outpaces our food supply. So eventually death and chaos ensue unless population growth is kept in check. Nature checks population growth through events like famines and plagues. Humans can preventatively check population growth through prudence and virtue. Well, Reverend Malthus wrote that 222 years ago. But some opinion writers have suggested the coronavirus-19 global pandemic is just such a Malthusian catastrophe. It's at work in our day. It's culling a few million from our herd. Well, I prefer to believe that a different lesson is being learned. That even after a tragic event, after war, disease, famine, tornado, flood, wildfire, human societies can recover their equilibrium by joining together in the effort as neighbors tend to do. We are coming through a crisis, but we're coming through it together. 
We are wise to remember that the potential of natural disaster, contagious disease, social dislocation is potentially always on the horizon. And we are wise also to make adequate precautions, preparations of emergency supplies. Collecting blankets for church world service, for example, that we have just done here in our church and providing financial support to our community through the United Way and other helping organizations. And also by not losing courage, not losing hope for the best. That's what will bring us back into balance as a community. Now I invite you to think back six weeks ago to that story of crucifixion and resurrection. Jesus' death was a horrific blow to his movement. None of his disciples would ever have believed that it could happen, but it did. And then, three days later, Jesus being raised from the dead was also entirely unexpected by his followers. It was even more so unanticipated by his adversaries. They thought they had ended his life on the cross, that it was dead, was done, was over. Father Richard Rohr, in his book, The Universal Christ, says resurrection is just incarnation taken to its logical conclusion. The preface to the Catholic funeral liturgy says, life is not ended, it is merely changed. Nothing is the same forever, says modern science. For example, 98% of our body's cells are replaced every year. Geologists with good evidence over millennia can prove no landscape is permanent. Water, fog, steam, ice, they're all the same thing, but at different stages and temperatures. Resurrection is another word for change, he writes, but particularly positive change. Resurrection is a revival of the good that we feared was lost a restoration of wholeness, a repair of what was broken, reconciliation of relationships that had come apart. It was enough, writes Father Rohr, for people to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead in order to somehow plant that hope and possibility of resurrection in our deepest unconscious. Jesus' first incarnate life, that is from his birth in Bethlehem, to how he lived his gospel day by day, to how he died, and then how he still lives in us today. That is, his passing over from life into death and then the subsequent resurrection into the ongoing Christ life in us and in the world is the archetypal model for the entire pattern of creation, he writes. Jesus is the map of the whole journey, in case you want one. Nowadays, writes Father Rohr, most folks don't seem to think that they need that map, especially when they're young. They already know better, or they're simply not yet curious. But the vagaries and disappointments of life's journey eventually make you long for some overall direction, some purpose or goal beyond getting through another day. Asking yourself, is this all there is? Even if they don't believe that Jesus was physically raised from the dead, writes Father Rohr, all who hold any kind of unexplained hope believe in resurrection, whether they are formal Christians or not. And he explains it like this. If matter is not only created by God, but it's inhabited by God, then matter is somehow eternal. The word eternal simply means with no beginning point and no ending. When the creed says we believe in the resurrection of the body, that means our bodies too, not just Jesus' body, unquote. All will be well. All will end well. Well, I think it's time for us to get into the Bible. Today's scripture reading is the opening paragraph of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And in it, we discover that Jesus has been presenting himself alive to his followers for 40 days after his passion. What that means is it had been six weeks since Jesus' death and resurrection, and the risen Christ was still appearing to them alive and speaking of the kingdom of God. 
But for us here in Alpena, it's been exactly that many weeks since Easter. So we can get a feel for how long the disciples had been staying indoors in that upper room in Jerusalem. They were hunkered down, they were hiding out, they were staying safe. It's just about how long you and I have been staying at home since the governor's emergency order directed us to do so. We are sequestered for fear of a microbe virus. They were self-quarantined by fear of the authorities. And I don't blame them. With the recent blatant public crucifixion of Jesus casting its shadow over their movement, these men and women who followed that radical rabbi from Nazareth knew that it was potentially a death penalty offense to be caught spreading his gospel message. It had only been six weeks since Jesus had been arrested, tried, and executed by the Romans, tortured and crucified and buried. It had been only 40 days since the crowd had turned on them. Their social reform movement had been condemned by the Jewish authorities in the temple and rejected by the leading Pharisee teachers of the law. It looked like it was all over. Time to go home. For the past 40 days, since Easter Sunday, the disciples had been staying put in their secluded upper room for fear of the authorities. But now we learn that during those six weeks, the risen Christ Jesus presented himself to them several times and spoke about the kingdom of God. Wow, and don't you wish we had a transcript of those teachings? This is the post-Easter Christ delaying his ascension, delaying his return to God the Father in heaven for six weeks in order to be sure that his followers fully understood what the kingdom of God is and how it may come on earth as it is in heaven and what it means for a person to be part of